charismatic, dazzling, dynamic. Freddie Mercury was one of rock music's all-time greatest showmen. Freddie just had that crowd in the palm of his hand. You just made everyone feel elevated. You just came away on such a high. But this smallest of small town boys, who reinvented himself as a world conquering rock god, had the most unlikely of beginnings. It doesn't seem believable that a dude who's born in Zanzibar with sizable teeth could become this unbelievable superstar. If you want to be as good as Freddy, you have to be superhuman. The voice, unique. Queen weren't just another band, they were the biggest band on the face of the planet. From day one, they knew what they wanted. Queen showed us how to be a stadium rock band. Tonight, we've gathered together super fans. They will be bigger than the Beatles, they'll be bigger than Elvis. Old Flames. He was a very ardent lover. And best friends. We just became closer, we're like brothers really. And almost three decades after his untimely death, we celebrate the moments that help make Freddie Mercury and Queen the legends they remain to this day. Freddie Mercury was a true icon. What amazes me is the charisma that he just exudes everywhere he went. The way he enjoyed every single second of being there and, and performing for people, he was just magnificent. But away from the spotlight, Freddie's friends saw a different side. Any sort of arrogance was an act on stage. You know, there was, there was none of that. I saw none of that behind the scenes. He was definitely two people, and, um, and I think the pressure of it was enormous. So how could a self-conscious boy from an island in the Indian Ocean transform himself into one of the world's most celebrated entertainers? He was unique then, and I think he was unique now, actually. And I think in a lot of respects, actually, he was probably the first genuine global Asian pop star. Along the way, writing one of the most startlingly original and unconventional songs in recording history. Baba, just killed a man. Talking about Bohemian Rhapsody is a bit like talking about the moon landings or the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The grandness, the scale is gigantic. <laughs> From the basements of 60s London to the pinnacle of the global stage, we chart the extraordinary ascent of the world's most unlikely rock star. Freddie Mercury was born Farouk Bulsara on the 5th of September 1946. His beamingly sunny personality evident early on in this charming, classically framed family portrait of baby Freddie. Growing up in Stonetown on the island of Zanzibar, the family was Zoroastrian by faith, an ancient, deeply traditional religion, and were wealthy by local standards, instilling an appreciation of arts and music into their young boy. Freddie being born on the island of Zanzibar is kind of exotic in itself and he's actually his family background, the values that they had and the traditional values that they had, it had a huge impact on him. They were quite privileged as a family. But apparently they had a white grand piano in the house, of all things, but, um, which he used to play, of course. His father, Bommy, worked for the British government and could afford a private education for Farouk. But that meant sending the eight-year-old 3,000 miles away to boarding school in India. It would mark the start of Freddie's great lifelong adventure. Impossible to miss, smiling sweetly in this stiffly posed school photo, Freddie, as Farouk became known by his schoolmates, developed a passion for rock and roll whilst at St Peter's. We talked about boarding school a lot because I was at boarding school too. He learned to play the piano and at his boarding school and mine we were allowed to have um, Elvis Presley, we were allowed to have all the kind of uh, current records. While at school, Freddie formed a band called the Hectics. Their love of performing shines through in this candid snapshot, epitomising both the era and their youthful passion. He was so into music at his private school, he formed his own little band 
and he would be playing the piano away and even composing then. He was very keen on mimicking, you know, Little Richard and anybody, even Cliff Richard. <laughs> In his early years, he was a shy boy, teased with the nickname Bucky for his prominent teeth which feature clearly in this formerly posed trophy shot of a bashful schoolboy Freddy. It was something that would cause him embarrassment for the rest of his life. As a child, Freddy definitely struggled with some bullying. The fact that people would talk about his teeth and the overbite that he had. Freddy had a great deal of self-consciousness about his mouth, his teeth and his smile. So he would always be pulling his lips in. Uh, Every time he smiled, he'd realise his teeth would stick right out. He had four too many teeth. And the logical thing would be to have these extra teeth taken out. But he point-blank refused. He used to do this, had this mannerism of uh, curling his top lip over his teeth. I thought it was fun, you know. I thought it was a sort of clever little tick that he had. But I think he was a little embarrassed about his protruding teeth. After finishing school in India, Freddie returned home, but in 1964 was uprooted once again when a violent revolution forced the Bulsaras out of Zanzibar. They moved to the UK and the sleepy West London suburb of Feltham. It was a massive culture shock for the whole family, but Freddie Bulsara's reinvention had begun. He had a lovely family, his uh, mother and father and his sister were lovely people very reserved, religious. His parents were resistant to 60s culture because it was quite a culture shock. It was all kicking off very much. You know. You've got that generational uh, struggle, haven't you, between their child to succeed in a conventional way, and then you've got the child themselves uh, who want to be creative and who want to be free and who want to break the bonds of the establishment that they've grown up in. His parents might not have approved of Western youth culture, but Freddie was more than ready to embrace it. It must have been a dream for him, actually, to turn up in 60s London, uh, where it was all happening. If we talk about swinging London, it's just a total generational shift. It's the idea that you can change, the idea that you can become someone that you want to be without the constraints that your parents would have grown up in. And, and it's that sense of liberation. It's almost impossible to imagine moving from Zanzibar to London. I mean, the actual 60s in London was a time of complete change and transformation. So I imagine it would have felt like an awakening. The pieces were falling into place and the extraordinary transformation of Farouk Bulsara into Freddie Mercury was underway. The 60s London teenage Freddie Bulsara found himself in had transformed into the youth capital of the world. This, ladies and gentlemen, is London. Swinging London, it's been called, though some people might find a different adjective. Eager to embrace everything on offer and explore his artistic tendencies, Freddie enrolled at Ealing Art College. Ealing College was a real melting pot for, um, for creativity. Ronnie Wood went to Ealing. Pete Townsend was at Ealing College as well. But the enigmatic boy from Zanzibar, posing here in typically laid-back fashion, was distinctly different from his fellow students. In India, the boarding schools taught their students to speak very good English. And he spoke in that way. He had a very um, good way of enunciating words. I was born in Jamaica. And when you come, you, 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 there's certain things you're just taught in those early years of your life, how to speak, how not to speak. And he was very clear, very precise. He sounded more English than most other English people at college. It was almost what you might call a posh accent, in a way, with a slight Indian tinge to it. It was a unique brogue Freddie would never lose, as we can hear in this tightly framed informal 1984 interview with Mercury coyly playing to the camera. I love it right now because I said earlier on, you're the last person I'm talking to, so you probably get the best interview, darling, don't I? He was 
charm. He was very, very, very polite. He had a lovely smile. He was very warm and very soft in his approach. Freddie was a very kind, gentle and, and loving person. There's a strange kind of wittiness about him. He's quite waspish. He used to say to me all the time, oh, Adrian, that sort of thing. They're very kind of proper. He's very intelligent. And he used that to beguile people in a way. And one student found herself especially beguiled by Freddie's charms. I think I was Freddie's first girlfriend. We had a physical relationship and he was a very ardent lover. He was different. Freddie did see himself as an outsider and it gave him a kind of freedom. He didn't have to toe the line, he didn't have to be like other people because he was from a, a different culture. Although he was as English or even more English than most people, that was the contradiction about him. But above all else, it was London's intoxicating music scene that proved irresistible to the wide-eyed Freddie Bulsara. We used to go to many, many gigs uh, at Eel Pie Island, which was a very famous venue and various other places. We'd have been exposed to a very broad spectrum of music at the time. But amidst all the acts that came and went, one explosive talent had a profound impact on Freddie and awoke him to the endless possibilities that might lie ahead. Freddie was an absolute super fan of Jimi Hendrix. He couldn't stop talking about Hendrix. Hendrix was a game changer for all of us. His kind of bravado, his confidence, his approach to playing was so intense. In fact, you might even say that Hendrix was Freddie's um, role model. Freddie's identification with Hendrix is really because, you know, Jimi is an outsider, a black dude working in a white rock world and really creating his own world. And also in terms of presentation as well, he's somebody who seemed as though he came from another planet. And I think Freddie really identified with that. Jimi Hendrix was a showman. He understood that Jimi Hendrix dressed like a, an old medieval performer almost. It was all fancy clothes and very soft furnishings. And he wanted to emulate that. Fired up, Freddie left college with a head full of rock star dreams, funding his ambitions running a clothes store in legendary hippie hangout Kensington Market with a friend by the name of Roger Taylor. I'd go up and hang out with him and Roger selling boots and fur coats and tat in Ken, Ken Market. It wasn't a particularly good stall, to be honest. It only sold scarves <laughs> a few other things. And these spontaneously shot and vibrant Polaroid snapshots reveal five years in the capital of Cool had clearly rubbed off on the previously demure 22-year-old. I did bump into him at Kensington Market and he was then, at that point, wearing some very flamboyant clothes because I, he came rushing up to me and uh, gave me a hug because I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. Very gushing, shall we say, yes. A slight change in personality, I would say. By this time, Freddie's friends were mainly other budding musicians, like Ken Market pal and wannabe drummer, dental student Roger Taylor, and a guitar-wielding physics student called Brian May, who would form Smile, a fairly unremarkable band that looked typical for the times, captured here on rare grainy footage. The stage was set for Freddie to make a dramatic entrance. Smile were never really that big. We were a local band, really. After all, I, I was still at college, Brian was still at college, Roger was still at college. The thing about Freddie was he was a flamboyant performer, and I never was. Along comes Freddie in 1970, and he sees Smile performing, and he likes what he sees to some degree. He likes, he likes the look, the sound of Roger's cannoning drums and Brian's squealing metalish guitar but he knows that he can do something better with them. So he sort of, he inveigles himself, he gets in though, he becomes a singer. When I decided to go, he jumped in and it proved to be exactly the right chemistry that created that fabulous quartet. Without any doubt, Fred was born to it. He definitely had massive ambition and it wasn't naked, raw, unpleasant ambition was sort of, I'll chew you up and spit you out type of thing, but you knew that what he wanted, he would get. I never quite believed we could achieve it, but they obviously did. They obviously 
were able to realise those notions of being the biggest band in... We're going to be the biggest band in the world. Yeah! It wasn't long before Freddie began stamping his personality on the band, starting with a radical rebrand. They obviously decided they wanted a really strong name, and especially Freddie wanted a very positive name. And Freddie wanted Queen. They met at Brian May's house. Freddie wanted to name the band Queen right from the beginning, and Brian wanted to call it something else. And Freddie said, no, it's going to be Queen, and that's it. <laughs> There's the obvious uh, double entendre, you know, the, the campness of it. Queen, it's a little bit provocative, it's a, especially in the early 70s, of course. This is a time when homosexuality was something that you didn't necessarily talk about and celebrate. There's this sense that comes from the name, this sense of power that they developed that comes from the name, which is magisterial. They are not afraid of kind of the pomp that comes with it in every single aspect. And while Queen were finding their feet, their colourful new frontman was embarking on what would become one of the most significant relationships of his life. Mary Austin was lovely. I mean, she was Freddie's girlfriend. She was very glamorous, very attractive, um, and, yes, very gentle. I think one of the people he was really, truly in love with was Mary. It was a core a core meeting of, of souls and people. Mary was very important to him because she was honest, she was caring. All she cared about was, was Freddie, and he cared so much about her. I mean, they did get engaged. They obviously had a deep love for one another um, and a deep respect. And I think in the early days when Fred had no money, you know, I think Mary supported him. Secure in a stable, traditional relationship, Freddie's fantasy life would play out on stage, reinventing himself as the rock star he was born to be. It isn't unusual for people who struggle early on in their lives to want to completely change their identity. Reinventing yourself is reclaiming your future and your present. There's no doubt Freddie changed his name um, to kind of escape the fact that there was a racist element actually in England at the time. You know, the idea of there being an Asian rock star at the turn of the 70s. I don't think it would have really been accepted. Freddie Mercury, what a name. What a statement that is, isn't it? From Farouk Bulsara to Freddie Mercury, it's just completely breaking those bonds, isn't it? The Mercury does fit him particularly well because, you know, it, it has, <laughs> oddly, uh, a kind of godly quality about it as well as, uh, you know, all the other uh, elements to that name. And I kind of feel as though, you know what? The thing about it is it suits him down to a T. Queen spent the next couple of years honing their act, and in 1973, armed with a record deal, they headed out on tour, supporting one of the biggest bands of the time. I was working for Mott the Hoople. Mott were rehearsing, and we're told, oh, the support band is coming in. Right, OK. And they come in in their satins and dresses and Zandra Rhodes, you know, flouncing, and get on the stage and... They go for it, you know. Fred was doing all the prancing around, and this was like a rehearsal. And everyone is sat there, you know, going, "Who is this Wally?" So from day one, they knew they wanted to be the biggest band in the world. By early '74, Queen had two albums under their belt and a keen cult following, but had yet to hit the mainstream. And if it hadn't been for a huge slice of luck. This oddball West London quartet might never have become the world's favourite rock band. Back in 74, David Bowie was supposed to appear on top of the pops in video form, his single Rebel Rebel. But the Rebel Rebel video wasn't complete. So on that very afternoon, Top of the Pops needed a group. And the only group who happened to be available at such exceptionally short notice were Queen. Dramatically dressed in black satin, Queen crackled with energy in a full-blooded performance of Seven Seas of Rye. I think I first became aware of Queen when I was watching telly and I suddenly saw this guy with makeup and long black hair and an outrageous costume. 
and I was deciphering whether man, female, whatever it was, and then the voice. I went, oh my goodness me, what is that? I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. It, it was unique. watching the seven seas of Brian on top of the pops and Roger and Brian and John look like great musicians doing their job but Freddie does feel like he's sort of from somewhere else in a slightly magical sense they do arrive fully formed and they arrive basically saying this is us even though they are not a big band by that point you know they're still fundamentally nobody it's not like they turn up and do some scrappy little number that people don't remember they turn up and do a fairly epic number in a style that everyone remembers. Queen were born, the single was a hit, and they didn't look back. The hugely contrasting follow-up single would prove their real breakthrough, hitting number two. It also allowed Freddie free reign on top of the pops to camp it up superbly in furs and show us his full off-kilter pomp rock swagger. She keeps them always shunned on in a pretty cabinet Let them eat cake, she says Just like Marie Antoinette The curiously 1930s rhythm and pop rock propulsion of Killer Queen perfectly suited its fae frontman. Killer Queen was different. Freddie here was channeling some sort of Noel Coward-esque swagger. It was very, very English. There was a bit of Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. And again, he was dressed like a dandy. She's a killer queen, young man in jeopardy, dynamite with a laser beam, guaranteed to blow your mind. It's very Freddy, very opulent quite silly, not taking itself too seriously. You knew that this was a band who weren't going to go in a straight line. They were going to take deviations. There was going to be different angles to everything that they did. For all the success of Killer Queen, nobody could have imagined the world-conquering musical phenomenon these comparative newcomers were about to unleash. Autumn 1975, and with their theatrical image and charismatic frontman, Queen had already earned a reputation as an unorthodox rock band. But when they took their biggest risk of all and started really experimenting, unlike their overindulgent prog rock peers, they created a monumental piece of rock history. just struck me as being one of those things that this is either going to be a catastrophic failure or it's going to be the biggest hit in the world. Even now, having heard that song maybe a thousand times, knowing every word and every single moment, it's still completely unique. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Right from its unmistakable opening few bars, Bohemian Rhapsody was genuinely something quite extraordinary. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. Using intricate, multi-layered vocals, the song immediately captures the imagination with its fascinating and otherworldly lyrics. Easy come, easy go. Little high, little low. It was such a charged song full of so much story and passion, and yet at the same time, it was a bit indecipherable as well. So you, it, it was just, I don't know, it was spectacular, and it still is. Talking about Bohemian Rhapsody is a bit like talking about um, the moon landings or the assassination of John F. Kennedy, isn't it? Because it's such an unearthly experience. But what would become Queen's biggest hit almost didn't happen. Record label EMI were reluctant to release a six-minute epic as a single, but Freddie's rock-solid belief in the song is clear in his forthright recollection of the conflict in this interview two years later. So we sort of chose that. Obviously, we came across uh, certain barriers, like it being uh, six minutes long or whatever, and we said, we, I mean, there were numerous rows. I mean, well, the recording the company wanted to, in actual fact, edit it. Right? Edit it and things like that, yes. And we just thought, there's no point. You either sort of hear it in its entirety 
or pick another, another song. Yeah. But despite its length, maverick DJ Kenny Everett was determined to make Bohemian Rhapsody a hit. Yes, what is it? They brought the tape to him. They'd gone to all the radio stations, and everyone said, "Oh, it's far too long. You've got to, you've got to shorten it. You've got to shorten it." And then Kenny said, and they walked in with this record, and he said, "Don't do a thing to it. Leave it. It's just fabulous." And he played it and played it. Kenny would say. I like that so much, let's hear it again. He just kept putting it on again, and, and he said, oh, my finger slipped. Oh, he wasn't allowed to play it because it was like six minutes long. And he said, well, I can't play this. Oh, it slipped. Mama just killed a man. Exquisite instrumentation and Freddie Mercury's distinctive vocals combined to deliver a song fusing musical genres and breaking all the rules. Effectively, it's like a mini opera. There's twists and there's turns, not just in terms of the narrative, but in terms of the sound. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? There's little bits of piano. There's these layered vocals. <laughs> Galileo, 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 Galileo It's opera to the masses because that was Freddie's passion. It was like, I love rock and roll. I love Mick Jagger, uh, I love La Traviata, I love Montserrat Caballé, and I don't see any reason why I shouldn't do them all in, in one song. This genre-busting fusion of opera and rock broke new ground then, but now sounds as natural and reassuringly familiar as any record ever made. Accompanying the revolutionary song was this pioneering avant-garde meets live gig video. It has become truly iconic. You'd never know it was actually something of an afterthought. When you actually look at the video, it's so simple. It's insane. It was done in a couple of hours, you know. I mean, it was literally done on the side. We had the big stage at Elstree with, with the, the stage set up on, and it was done off to the side. And I think, you know, a few sort of beer crates for them to stand on, a bit of black drape, run through the heavy bit three times, get the smoke going, and, and that was it. Queen had officially hit the big time, and the entire world was starting to take notice. It was then this roller coaster, and you started to get a feeling, OK, you know, I could be... I could be in on something here. And then, by the time... We were halfway through the tour. Bo Rap was number one, and the album was number one, and they were the darlings of the press. And I think that really took them to another level. After Christmas, off to the States, off to Japan. 1977. And as Queen's popularity grew, so did the size of the venues they were filling and the boundary-pushing quartet was soon creating purpose-built, towering anthems fit to command these vast spaces. I think Queen looked at their audience and just basically, you know, wanted that audience to have a good time. We were rehearsing for the uh, News of the World album, and we used to rehearse before an album. Uh, the, I think Fred like to call it routining. So he comes in, Mercury the winged messenger in his white spandex, and I've got this idea, darling, what was it, right? It's a song about football. What? The sort of anthemic qualities of We Will Rock You and, and We Are The Champions, uh, those are deliberate things, but they're also just so enduring and so infectious. The hooks were just so universal. You don't even have to sing the lyric. The, the hook is, Bum, bum, bum. The bombastic rhythm and driving guitar of We Will Rock You perfectly suited the cavernous arenas Queen found themselves playing in, like this breathless performance in Montreal. Those songs were made to be played in stadiums. 
they know how to how to unite an audience. He had a little riff. There aren't any instruments on it really, apart from his guitar. And that was Brian, I think, saying this is for the this is for the audience. It really is a case of give the people what they want. It's like you can participate in this. So there's just this natural understanding of how to get rid of that barrier between us and them. The song gave Freddie the ideal platform to interact with fans and demonstrate his remarkable ability to reach every member of the audience. He was very good at communicating with all parts of the stadium. Um, and even though when the stages got bigger, he had the runways and things. And he would always, at least a couple of times a show, go out to that side, go out to that side. Written by Freddie, We Are The Champions is based around Mercury's trademark classical chord structures and quickly became another dependable crowd pleaser, as in this memorable later performance at Wembley Stadium, with a half-naked Mercury imperiously holding court at the piano. And bad mistakes I made a few We are the champions. It's so unbelievably operatic in its intent, I think. It's, it's melodramatic. We are the champions. It's not saying us four on stage here are the champions. It's all of us. We are champion. We're all king. We're all, you know, we're all brilliant at something. Never forget that. It's about hope. We Are The Champions provided a suitably rousing climax and gave impassioned stadium audiences, here again at Wembley, the chance to feel at one with each other and the band. Freddie in particular, the live focus, entirely lost in his own performance. As Freddie's on-stage bravado reached new heights, off-stage, his seven-year relationship with Mary had fallen apart when his personal life reached a crossroads. They were living in quite a nice flat by then, and uh, he was coming home later and later, and she thought it was another woman. And, but he'd, say, he'd come back and say, oh, I was kept late at the recording studio. We started to think, well, yeah, he's probably bisexual. And then it was clear that, you know, he was spending more time away from Mary. Eventually he came home one night and uh, he said, Mary, I've got something I must tell you. And she really thought, this is it. He's going to ask me to leave. He's, he's found another woman. She was the person who could speak truth to power. And when Freddie said, I'm sleeping with men, I'm bisexual, she was the person who said, no, you're not bisexual, Freddie, you're gay. All I knew was that their relationship, they were very close. And I knew from Freddie that whatever happened, that Mary was there and she would always be there regardless. He never let go. And I think he loved her, of course. And she loved him. Finally reconciled with his sexuality, Freddie felt confident enough to explore avenues away from the macho world of rock. The first surprising departure was in 1979, when he accepted an offer from the Royal Ballet, who were looking to attract a wider audience to a lavish charity gala. I remember when we put him into All Over Tights. I mean, I wouldn't have worn All Over Tights and I was fit, but if he was going to be a ballet dancer, he had to have a leotard and tights and ballet shoes. You know, he went all the way and did it properly. He'd never danced before in his life, and they lifted him up at the end of the performance, and they turn him upside down. And he's hanging upside down in this, in this. I don't know how they did it, I don't know how he did it. He was manoeuvred. <laughs> Lift. <laughs> Lift me. But in a nice position, of course. Upside down, and still singing, by the way. 
afterwards, when I did the interview with him, he said, well, I'd like to see Mick Jagger do that or Elton John. <laughs> Freddie had reinvented himself yet again. Queen had never been bigger. And together, they were about to conquer the entire world. By the late 70s, pop culture in the UK had seen massive change, with punk's two-fingered salute leading the charge against the virtuoso musical elite and flamboyant acts like Queen. Punk was a fantastic breath of fresh air, musically and culturally, but that did leave Queen on, Queen on a sticky wicket, because where are you supposed to go with that? Basically, Queen are meant to roll over and die, you know, and of course, they don't. It just carries on. The band's response was, of course, to plough on regardless, doing things their way, which for a now liberated Freddie also meant a whole new lifestyle and soon a whole new look to reflect it. Queen still knew what their fans wanted, and anthems like Don't Stop Me Now, with its stripped-back, no-frills video, let their seemingly unfashionable music do the talking. Don't Stop Me Now is almost like Freddie trolling the punks, isn't it? That's Freddie saying to everybody, darling, my life is wonderful. Uh, it's also uh, a very hedonistic lyric. That's one of the most sort of coveted, um, requested, and sort of universal songs that they did. Um, kids love it, grannies love it, everybody loves it, but at the end of the day, it's about Freddie having an absolutely marvellous time in the way that only Freddie could. Freddie was certainly enjoying his newly empowered sexuality in the heart of the London gay scene. It was Kenny Everett, actually, who more or less brought him out. Kenny, they used to meet up a lot, and then Kenny would, would go to the gay bars and take Freddie along, and then I think that's really when it struck a note with Freddie that he would like to try another life. However, it wasn't just the London scene Freddie threw himself into. There was a period where he was living in New York and he was, he was frequenting the New York gay scene, which was also where he first came across Glenn Hughes, who was the biker in The Village People. And that transformed not so much Freddie's life, but Freddie's image. And from there, he began to use more hardcore gay imagery. The caps, the moustache, the vest, the leather. There was a look, and I think, you know, he, he, he loved it. He, he loved, I think, a sort of a more romantic and macho look. Freddie even gamely lampooned his new gay biker chic, appearing as a special guest on Playmate Kenny's show in a typically anarchic sketch. Do your stuff, Fred. <laughs> Freddie and Kenny were just so witty and so, so much fun. You can see that he's becoming far more confident about who he is as a human being, not just as a gay man, but as an individual and as a performer, and that shines on stage. Years later, in a breezily informal interview, a self-deprecating Freddie joked about the motivation for his radical change of look. At this point in time, I think if I had long hair and, and fingernails and wearing the things, I would look ridiculous. I mean, I looked ridiculous then, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all right then, so um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just growing up and, and, and gaining experience. After years struggling with his appearance, it seemed Freddie had finally found the style he was most comfortable with. And as he moved with the times in terms of fashion, back in the studio, the band were now shifting direction too. During the recording sessions for 1980 album The Game, bassist and musical dark horse John Deacon demoed what would become perhaps the most infectious bass riff groove in pop, with the unlikely lead instrument given extreme close-up treatment in another no-nonsense promo. John Deacon just pulling out these 
absolutely enormous hits that are so undeniable that even the the dad rockers in the band, you know, Roger in particular, I think, not a big fan of this disco direction. I think within the group, there's obviously a discussion as to, you know, whether another one bites the dust is suitable for Queen. But I think as soon as they start playing and as soon as they start finding the groove, they realise that they might not all agree, but they know that it is Queen. Freddie's astonishing vocal and wiry strutting in the Back to Basics video helped the funky foot stomper become another monster hit across the globe and, crucially, number one in the US. That's the power of Queen and Freddie, is that he could take a song that was not his at all and he, he could make it his, uh, make it sound as though he'd written it and he's selling it to you so hard that you think, he must have written all these songs. It looked like the risk of throwing off their rock roots and diversifying into disco had paid off. Whilst humbly acknowledging the fickle nature of pop superstardom, Brian May looked happily back on this killer time for Queen. We kind of became the biggest group in the world at that moment. You know, it's, it's a fleeting moment because someone else will come and take over, but for that moment, we kind of owned the world. Brian's instincts about the volatile nature of fame rang true shortly afterwards, when the release of a very British, high-camp, tongue-in-cheek, cross-dressing video would soon undo all their hard work across the pond. I want to break free. I want to break free. It's humoristic, and, you know, and they, 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 they never took themselves too seriously, Queen. Fred's a housewife pushing a hoover and... They're all different characters. Roger, a very convincing schoolgirl. John, an old granny, and Brian, I'm not quite sure who Brian was. But it was great fun on the day, on the set, everyone loved it. The video may have been a hoot to film, but questions soon arose as to the motivation behind it, with detractors presuming the campness was all of Mercury's doing. So, with good grace, Freddie set the record straight in this laid-back interview down under. It wasn't my idea at all. I'm sure everybody thinks it's, it's my idea being, being it's outrageous. It was Roger's, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it came from Roger. And, and I was, um, and everybody thinks, I bet, that they, in fact, they asked me, so how did you get the other three to get into them? In fact, they ran into their frocks <laughs> quicker than anything. Freddie clearly saw the funny side. But in the much more conservative US, it was a very different story indeed. America hated it. And the American record company said to them, well, can you do another video? Just a performance video, whatever. And the band said, no, I'm not doing it. And unfortunately, that video killed them in America. Seemingly dead in the water stateside, Queen looked instead to a neighboring continent with similarly huge arenas. But this was uncharted territory for rock bands, for then, understandable reasons. The infrastructure wasn't set up for bands to play in South America. You know, you hear horror stories of, you know, um, people getting abducted and and, you know, kidnapped for, for, you know, we've got your lead singer, you know, and we want whatever for him. Queen bravely took on South America in 1981. Roger Taylor describing his nerves before a gig in Brazil in typically matter-of-fact fashion in this enlightening interview. I can remember being nervous the first night. The top tier alone took 80,000, and we were in this sort of dugout which I guess the football teams would normally be in. But all the windows were broken. And I remember thinking, hmm, this is, you know, it's going to take some balls to walk out there. If the band had any nerves, they certainly didn't show. Footage from the heart of the action in Sao Paulo gives a visceral sense of Queen cranking crowd energy levels up from the off. The idea of you could go to South America and be a ginormous rock band and play those kind of places, you know, that, that's really very much a, a Queen-led thing. The South American tour featured a surprising crowd-pleaser in tender, delicate ballad, Love of My Life. This rendition in Rio shows Freddie utterly in his element, creating a unique and intimate bond with his audience. He was kind of terrifying, I think, to the governments of South America. The idea that Freddie was in control of nearly half a million people in one night. The sort of control that they could only get through military means. All he needed was his microphone.
Queen were now the world's premier stadium rock act, but backstage they were also becoming the number one party band. From the obvious relish with which Roger speaks, it's clear he hugely enjoyed those heady times. There was a man who, uh, uh, he was actually a person of restricted growth, who did lay under meats. He said, when asked what he did, he said, I lay under meats. And uh, he's covered in sort of cold cuts and, and sort of um, chopped liver and stuff like that. And you couldn't see him. And so people would approach the trestle table and as they just reached out to scoop their meat, he would just move like that. And that was his act. <laughs> Queen definitely topped all the other bands when it came to their entertainment and their parties. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I think most bands wouldn't put their hands so deep into their pockets for, 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 for people, you know, like Queen did and Freddie did. He had this zest for living. He lived life to the full. That's, if every, he'd have a party every night if he could. <laughs> and often did. They're incredibly discreet about this. You didn't hear about any Queen members getting arrested for drink and drugs. You didn't hear about any of them going into rehab. If you're looking for scandal on Queen, there isn't really that much. Whilst Queen may have avoided press scrutiny for their audacious backstage antics, in 1984, they'd find themselves cast as Rock's bad guys as they ventured to South African vacation playground, Sun City, which at the time was a whites only resort. It was another market, another territory, you know, it's like we conquered South America, Japan, you know, South Africa, we're going to conquer there. The problem with actually making an appearance there was, one, that it broke the United Nations boycott, and two, that it also broke a musicians' union boycott. Queen landed in the apartheid state with press-friendly sound bites at the ready. The seeming innocence and enthusiasm of this news VT belies the complex politics beneath the surface. Boys, it's very nice to be here in South Africa, and I just want, want to have a good time. Anything you'd like to say to your South African fans? Yeah, we hope you get real excited, and because um, we're pretty excited to be here. Did you know that you had so many fans in South Africa? Well, we, I think we had some idea that, uh, of our popularity here, but uh, we didn't realise it was quite that. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. However, maybe they were told they were playing to mixed audiences. And I mean, I never saw a black face in the audience. I mean, it was a horrible place. I mean, it was Las Vegas in the bush. Things were never quite the same again for Queen. People regarded them as mercenaries. The flack Queen received would always hit a nerve. But in retrospect, as these somewhat frosty documentary interviews clearly underline, Brian and Roger still have strong and conflicting feelings on the controversy. There was all sorts of hoo-ha going on, you know, you mustn't play Sun City because it's, um, because it's a sign that you're supporting apartheid. Well, it's simply not true. If you adopted a policy of never playing in a country where you don't approve of the politicians, there would really be very few places you can play. I will say to me that um, we acted properly according to our conscience as regards South Africa. Um, we went there to play music the same as we did all kinds of other places. We got so much shit for it, and, but we went for good reasons. Uh, but on balance, I think it was a mistake to go. Sun City lost Queen a lot of fans, but just one year later, they would have a shot at redemption on a truly global scale, which would become, for many, one of the greatest moments in musical history. By the mid-1980s, relentless touring and the attendant rock star lifestyle had taken its toll on Freddie and the band, and it seemed the mighty Queen juggernaut was slowly grinding to a halt. At that point, I think people had sort of thought, OK, well, maybe Queen had, had had their day, you know, maybe that, that was the best, what, what we've already heard. They'd had the success, but, you know, it has its, its tolls. You, you look back and you think, the pressure of it, is phenomenal. And I think Fred used to say, God darling, some days I wake up and I just don't want to be Freddie Mercury today. Brian May almost dispassionately expressed the band's feelings in this later unfussy interview. We were sort of feeling a bit, um, I don't know if trapped is the right word, but we felt we were on this 
sleigh ride and, and what was going to come next. And we'd actually said, OK, we don't want to do anything for a while. However, should they choose to accept it, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to remind the world exactly how magisterial queens still were was just one monumental gig away. In 1985, in angry response to the worst Ethiopian famine in living memory, Bob Geldof embarked on the daunting task of assembling the biggest global names in music to perform at the charity gig to end all charity gigs, Live Aid. You've got to remember, I mean, Live Aid, nothing had been done where there were so many sort of known bands um, playing a festival together. So it was, a, it was a kind of a, it was a bit of a venture into the unknown. For Queen especially, they'd had their difficult times. They weren't necessarily a unit so much anymore. They had a lot more to surmount to get to that point where they were match fit enough to know that they could have done a good job. Despite Queen's initial reluctance to get on board, Geldof eventually managed to persuade the band to sign up. And with Live Aid looming, a ring-rusty Queen threw themselves into rehearsals. This rare footage clearly shows the band's commitment to making their set rock with as much vibrancy and power as they could summon. You'd think with all the back catalogue they had then, and you've got to find 18, 20 minutes, God, you know, how are you going to do it? And I went out and I bought these big white plastic clocks and I put them on the front of the stage so we could time the set. It was done very professionally and actually without any real arguments, you know, um, as to the final running of it. With a 72,000 Wembley crowd locked and loaded, Queen's slot neared, and Freddie psyched himself up with a little aperitif. I was in the dressing room, and they were going to go on, and he just had a glass of vodka, a cigarette, and then he shot through that door. It was like a hurricane. In their pomp, they might have been undisputed kings of stadium rock, but could they still cut it? At 6.41pm on the 13th of July, 1985, Queen bounded on the stage, with ringmaster Freddie gleefully whipping the thronging crowd up into a frenzy, even before a single note was played. It was never in any doubt. The way that he captivated millions of people all around the world, it was almost like a transcendental experience. Suddenly, it didn't matter that I was at home in the north of England watching a cruddy TV. I was there. With a close-up camera acting as the eager eyes of the world, Freddie effortlessly eased himself into Queen's most famous piece of live theatre. The stage was set for rock history to be made in a mere 17 minutes. He takes the stage as if it's his living room and just talks to them as if they're sitting on a settee in front of him. It's all very personal, even though it's epic. They played a 17-minute hits medley very much responding to Bob Geldof's instruction to give the people what they want. With Freddie in resplendent stage strutting form, an object lesson in pomp and circumstance, the band then took an already barnstorming performance up to 11. The crowd went gaga. Radio Gaga at Live Aid is one of the finest musical moments of all time. And you can't resist. You've got to do it. It's a compulsion. Everybody else is doing it. Are you going to be the only person out of 72,000 people with his hands in his pockets? As the epic cinematography expansively conveyed the emotionally charged synchronicity between Freddie and the audience, it seemed Queen had lifted Live Aid to an altogether different level. Radio. They'd also taken it to another sound level, as a delicious bit of techie mischief ensured their decibel count would exceed the rest. The uh, People's Republic of Brent, the noise police, as you said, you have to limit the sound. And the sound system used at Live Aid was Queen's sound company. 
an air sound engineer, worked for them. And basically, he turned the limiters off, so Queen were louder than everyone else. Oh, Now joyfully playing to the crowd, Queen inevitably finished on a high with a song that suddenly had even greater resonance. Mercury was never more perfectly in his element and leaving no doubt whatsoever which band were the champions of the day. Freddie Mercury, is he the best front man on the planet or is he not? And, you know, it was like, wow, everyone was knocked out, glued to that screen backstage watching Queen. It is just a perfect piece of footage of a perfect performance, the perfect time in the perfect place with the perfect band. They walked off suddenly being a band again. I mean, it's an incredible moment for them because it's, it's, it's like, have you forgotten how good we are? Have we forgotten how good we are? Have this. Live Aid was the catalyst for a rejuvenated Queen to embark on a tour, which was sadly to be Freddie's last performances with the band. In 1987, Freddie embarked on various solo projects, including an entirely unexpected and yet somehow perfect collaboration. At the time we did Barcelona, Montserrat Caballé was the female Pavarotti. And a lot of people now do these crossovers and crossover music, classical things, have got their way into sort of popular music charts. But then there was nothing before it. The resulting song was a tour de force of virtuoso vocals, with the two artists working in unison to create this truly unique harmony and spectacle. No opera singer, but he could certainly handle himself in a duet with one of the great singers of the last century. Despite the joy of working with one of his idols, Freddie had begun to feel increasingly unwell. And then the most devastating bombshell was dropped. Having been secretly living with HIV for a number of years, Freddie had developed full blown AIDS. In the 80s, and AIDS was relentless, it was agonising, it was tortuous, it was an illness that would desecrate the human body. You were given a death sentence. Even when Fred began to be noticeably ill, we still, I think, went into some sort of denial that it will be fine. And it was never really a topic up for discussion. You just thought, ah, this is Fred, you know, I mean, he will crawl off his, his sick bed to, to play to 50,000 people. No, you'll be all right, uh, you know, they'll find a cure. Though Freddie knew there was no recovery, he was characteristically determined to make the most of the limited time he had left as he reunited with the band in the recording studio. I can't imagine what it was like to be in the studio and they just wanted to, to be there for him and give him the strength he needed, but uh, it's got to have been unbelievably difficult. Another hero, another mindless crime behind the curtain. The dignified and painstakingly constructed video for The Show Must Go On revisited some of Queen's most iconic moments with a clear and deeply moving message of defiance in the face of sheer adversity. Show For the whole band, it's hugely significant. It's almost like a sort of tying up of everything, of, of what they've done to that point. I think there's a vulnerability that they accept themselves and that they then go back into their own history that allows you to connect with them even more as a result. As Queen tried to come to terms with the quiet tragedy of the situation through music, their fans would soon see for themselves that something was terribly wrong. I think by 1990, it was still sort of shrouded in mystery. And he appeared at the, the Brit Awards that year with the band. And it was obvious he was very ill. In the full glare of a multi-camera broadcast, the band took to the podium to collect their outstanding contribution award. But Freddie's determined stride was at odds with his gaunt appearance and untypically reserved manner. It was to be the final time we'd see him in public. Thank you.
Queen had enjoyed the best part of two decades as one of the biggest rock bands in the world. It's not an exaggeration to say they irrevocably changed the face of rock. But as the 90s began, their talismanic frontman was becoming increasingly frail. Yet still, Freddie remained insistent on recording as many songs as possible, and it's moving to hear Brian's pain memories of that deeply saddening period in this revealing interview. Freddie at that time said, write me stuff. He said, I know I don't have very long. Keep writing me words, keep giving me things. I will sing, I will sing. And he finds it hard to stand up a lot of the time. But he'll throw a couple of vodkas down and he would prop himself up on the mixing desk and have his mic there and go for it. The heart-rending video and elegiac lyrics to These Are The Days Of Our Lives would mark Freddie's final appearance on camera. Sometimes I get to feel it. I was back in the old days, long ago When we were kids, when we were young Things seemed so perfect, you know Seeing him there looking so frail, you know, that was tragic. Music played such an important part in Freddie's life. I think that, you know, not only did it get him through his life, um, but it helped him to get through facing death. I still love you as the touching song reached its conclusion, the weakened Freddie left fans with the most poignant of messages. I still love you. The voice is just incredible on it. It's just amazing. You know, he was a complete one-off. The bravery Freddie had shown through the music, determined it would be his lasting legacy, was also reflected in the way he approached his final days, many of which were spent with his longtime friend, Mary Austin. She used to sit with him something like six hours, you know, and he asked whether she put on a video of a concert he'd done. And at the end of it, he turned to her and said, I was handsome then, wasn't I? And, uh, and she said, you're still handsome now, you know, but uh, very touching, very sad. Freddie Mercury passed away on the 24th of November, 1991. He was just 45 years old. I just went numb, actually. I, I, I couldn't take it in, really. Oof. Yeah, what can you say? Yeah. Tragic. We lost, we lost a, a great man. I felt a mix of sadness and also he, a kind of a sense of conclusion that he'd done the thing he wanted to do. You know, he would now move from being a great singer to becoming some kind of legend. Five months after Freddie's passing, the surviving members of Queen assembled the greatest roster of pop and rock royalty since Live Aid for the ultimate in tribute concerts. As a gig itself, it was amazing, it showed just how much respect there was for Freddie. I think everybody remembers George Michael's performance as being just this, this moment. And it's really simple as to why, because he sang so bloody brilliantly. That was a tribute. That was the real deal. That was like a great singer doing a great singer and saying, I'm not going to change a note because it's perfect. Amidst this star-studded bill, it was indeed George Michael who best evoked the spirit of Freddie, leading the whole stadium in the Mercury-esque arm-waving crescendo of Somebody to Love. Ten years after the rock world gathered en masse to pay tribute to one of their own, the music of Queen had a theatrical reinvention in an unlikely sounding but colossally successful Ben Elton Penn sci-fi musical. It lasted for 12 years in London's West End. It tours today. It's fabulously successful. Then you've got Queen and Adam Lambert, which then brings another 10 years worth of audience members. And then you've got Bohemian Rhapsody, the film, which has taken a billion dollars. So every 10 years, they're suddenly the most current band. It's amazing. It's real masterstroke. 2018's Bohemian Rhapsody biopic was a huge success, 
And while some critics bemoaned its factual inaccuracies, all were united in lauding Rami Malek's spookily spot-on portrayal of Freddy, his pitch-perfect feel for the star's mannerisms and wit, and him an Oscar. So tell me, what makes Queen any different from all of the other wannabe rock stars I meet? I'll tell you what it is. We're four misfits who don't belong together playing to the other misfits, the outcasts right at the back of the room who are pretty sure they don't belong either. We belong to them. When I went to see Bohemian Rhapsody, the film, somebody asked me afterwards um, what I thought. I said, oh, I think Freddie would like to have been here. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie hasn't actually really left us. He might not be in the room, but he and Queen, you know, are, are here. And Queen are here. They, they, and they've kept the music going, which is what Freddie wanted. Three, two, one! The success of Bohemian Rhapsody confirms the music of Queen is here to stay. Now, nearly 30 years since Freddie's passing, his legacy and spirit still loom large over the fans and those who knew him. His legacy is his songs, and that's what's great, because he was a very private person, but what he gave to the public, he gave in spades. His eyes, he just had just that promise of real mischief, and, you know, his, his eyes would sort of <laughs> dance and twinkle before his, his words would, would come out, and he, would, he would just had a, a complete magic about him. I most remember the love he radiated towards us. Sorry. And the generosity and the voice. If you want to be as good as Freddie, you have to be pretty superhuman. It was a quite a remarkable mixture of the best of everything you need to be an artist, and he had the lot. I knew at the end of his life, I said, how would you like to be remembered? So I'd just like to be remembered that I've left somebody happy. He certainly made me happy, but there's not much happiness for those in Brand New when luxury holidays go horribly wrong. Brand New tomorrow night at 10.15. Next tonight, criminals caught on camera.